So we've been on this journey with uh, with the uh, the weekly devotions and chapels that we've had this last time. Yes, we we've been all over the, all over the map. You know, and who's on your band? Who's riding with you? How transparent are you? Are you being vulnerable? And the and the risk of being vulnerable. You know, we've heard other people's stories that all kind of relate to that. I hope you're moving forward in a way that says, yeah, I'm going to be more real and more vulnerable with the people around me. It's a risk. And I'm going to be more accepting to the people around me and how they share their story. Some of you are, are, are doing that, and it's awesome. And, uh, and we're hearing good reports on that. Others, just like, it is, you know, you're pushing back on it. And so the hope is you'll continue to move forward in that way as you hear more and more stories. So today... Uh, we got another story, and it's somebody that you know. She's a senior, and we're going to go ahead and ask you to walk on up. Uh, Morgan, Sarah's going to join her all as well, but uh, Morgan uh, Booker is a senior this year, and uh, she uh, serves on our golf team, and uh, several people. I was actually uh, in a golf tournament about a month ago, I guess it was, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and um, and uh, somebody had said, hey, there's, there's somebody that that I think might be good to share the story and she might want to do it. So we were playing through on this Brewer Golf Invitational and our golf team was stationed different places and I think you saw my band or something. We made this connection. I was like, she said, I, I'd, I'd like to share my story. And I said, oh, you're the one. She said, yeah, I'm the one. So we got together. Some of you know a little bit about Morgan. A lot of us don't. But we're in for a, a great treat for her to share her story. So I want you to turn off whatever you got on. You know, I know some of you got quizzes afterwards, but trust me. The quiz, <clears throat> you're not going to do as good as you think if you stay for five more minutes. I'm just telling you. So shut it down and, and, and zone in here to what um, Morgan has to share. And I think you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna see God show up in yet another life and see where he'll do the same for you. So welcome Morgan, everybody. Okay? Thank you. Well, for starters, I'm going to focus a lot on my story that happened in the past year. But for a little background, I grew up in a Catholic church and I attended a Catholic high school all the way through school. And then when I graduated, I actually attended Murray State University in Murray, Kentucky to play golf. I get to school and within the first month, I'm sexually assaulted by a guy on the golf team. It was extremely hard. It was someone I was very close to, didn't really understand what was going on in my life. So from there on, I had lost six classmates from the time I graduated in May until January of my freshman year of college. It was heartbreaking and it felt out of control. This is where my need for control picked up. And to be honest, God was kind of gone in my life. I didn't really know who he was, where he was. Yes, I went to a Catholic high school, but I never really pursued a relationship with him. In January, I transferred to Lipscomb. At first, I was just trying to get my foot in the door, playing golf, getting used to school, going to chapel. Come to find out, I really enjoyed chapel. It was different than I ever expected, and it was very interesting. I actually attended After Dark that January, and I remember nailing things to the cross and getting my little key, and I still have that to this day. And after that, I felt like God was calling me to do something get to know him. So I actually contacted Brent High and I asked him if there was anyone that I could meet with. And he led me to meet with Shannon O'Brien, who from there on I met with probably once a week for several months. And then in April, I was baptized in the Colts Heavenly Athletic Training Room. It was a great experience. I mean, it wasn't like an aha moment when I came out of the water, but it was just like God had cleaned me of those sins and everything that had happened in my life. Like, it was time to start over. It was time for a fresh start. At this point, I'm dating a guy who attended Belmont, and we're going into a long-distance relationship. He is from Florida. I'm from Kentucky. And this is where my eating disorder really started to pick up. I, with all the loss and everything I had experienced, I was really in a need for control. And over the summer, to deal with the pain of long distance and being apart, I became obsessive over food and exercise, not eating, over exercising. Really wanted to have the best body that anyone could ever dream of. I arrived back in school in August, and I remember several of my friends coming up to me saying, Morgan, you look sick. What is wrong? And I sit here thinking, what do you mean, what's wrong? Like, I survived long 
distance, like everything's going great, what's wrong? But I actually remembered at that moment, sitting in a psychology class here at Lipscomb, and we were talking about eating disorders, and I started to cry. I thought, maybe this is what's going on with me. Maybe I do have a problem with this. So I was in denial for a very long time. Finally reached out to Shannon, who led me to Casey Allen to go and meet with her and kind of talk about what was going on in my life. So I was meeting with Casey, and she told me, yes, I did have an eating disorder. And from there on, she just was trying to help me get started and tell me to eat and that it would be okay. Well, towards the end of November, I stopped seeing her completely. At this point, I've kind of pushed God to the side because I want all the control. I don't want to trust him with my life. So I'm thinking, okay, I can do this all on my own. All I have to do is eat. December rolls around. I'm going on a mission trip to Honduras with the athletic department. And I had not told my parents about my eating disorder. The day before I left, I finally decided it's time to tell them. Everyone is very scared. I remember Brent saying not too long ago that he thought I was going to have a heart attack in Honduras and there was going to be nothing he could do about it. Thankfully, I came back and I had a great time on the trip, but now I can look back and see if only I had been healthy, what would I have been able to do in those kids' lives. In January, Shannon and Casey called me into an office and they sat me down with tears down their face saying, Morgan, we can't let you go on like this anymore. You've got to get help. And in that moment, I felt hurt and betrayed and I felt like they didn't believe in me. Now looking back, them telling me that was what saved, one of the things that saved my life. So I decided to go to a consult at Renfrew, which is here in Brentwood, Tennessee. And they went through and asked me a bunch of questions and told me that I really did need treatment. And I decided to do the day treatment program, which was Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. I had contacted my teachers and golf coach and just kind of said, you know, I'm going to do this. Is there any way you'll work with me? Of course, everyone here was more than willing to work with me. So I attended Renfrew for about six weeks when I finally hit rock bottom. I ended up in the psych ward for five days. At this point in my life, I did not want to be here. I was scared. I felt out of control. And it was probably the hardest thing in my life. Shannon and Brent came and said, Philip Hutchinson, to the psych ward and sat with me and they told me that God was going to use this for something greater. There was something that was good that was going to come out of this. And when I got out, I decided I needed a higher level of care. Ren Renfrew was just not working for me and I needed more intense treatment. So I looked around and I found a place in St. Louis called Callum Place. And I found it very intriguing because they had a program that was for college athletes with eating disorders. So I got there at the end of March. And for the first couple weeks, it's really hard. The first day I said, I'm leaving. I'm going to sign AMA, which is against medical advice, and come back. I didn't want to fight. Well, a couple weeks into it, I ended up back in the hospital, not for psychiatric reasons but just because my body was failing and it was struggling. And I remember laying in that bed saying, God, just take me. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of suffering. What good is going to come out of this? I'm ready to go. Then I get a package at the hospital, not really knowing who it's from, and I open it, and it's from my Bible professor here at Lipscomb, Kate Watkins. And in it, she gave me her book, she had struggled with an eating disorder for 20 years. And it was just like her journey with her eating disorder. And I read through that book as I'm laying in the hospital. And it was just like a huge turning point for me. It was like, if she can do this, I can do this too. And just knowing the impact that she had had in my life, I was like, God has a purpose for this and I'm going to do this. So 
I get out of the hospital. Well, actually, while I was in the hospital, I ended up with a feeding tube. And this was extremely devastating. I couldn't believe that I was that sick. It was like my worst nightmare was coming true. I always said that I never wanted that to happen. But at this point, I was so sick, I had to have something to help me. Several weeks went by, finally got my feeding tube out, and treatment's going well. And I'm doing Bible studies with girls that are in treatment with me and attending church. And finally, like I opened my Bible one day and John 3.30 just like popped out at me. And it says, God must become greater, I must become less. This is when I realized that I could not be in control of my life. I could no longer control my eating, like I could not be submissive to my eating disorder. Like God was in control of my life and he was going to overcome this and help me, re or help redeem this process. So at the get through treatment, this is towards the end of June, it's finally time for me to discharge. And I'm sitting there thinking, wow, I did this. But at the same time, I'm sitting there crying because it was a place that felt safe for me. It felt comfortable. People understood what I was going through. It was in a controlled environment, so people didn't make comments about food or body image. And just, I don't know. Sitting here in this chair, I'm realizing that God really does have a purpose for each and every one of our lives. And there is nothing he wants more than to be there for us and to carry us through these things and to redeem us from these horrible things. told me about a couple books that you read. One was, You Are Already Amazing. That, that theme came up, and you are made for a God-sized dream. Share with them about a little bit of that, the impact of those books and that, that message for you. Okay, well, before I left for St. Louis, Shannon gave me a devotional called You're Already Amazing by Holly Gert. And in treatment, we were going through, like on the weekends when we got privileges, they would take us to the bookstore. So I was all into like Christian books and self-help books to see like how I was going to build my truth channel. And I just happened to come across the books and it was a series and it was You're Already Amazing and You're Made for a God-Sized Dream. And I read these books 
and it just impacted me so much because I realized that what I was going through was so small in the big picture. Like, I was going to be able to use my story to impact more people than I could ever imagine, but it was all for his glory, not for me. And just realizing that God was in complete control of my life, and he led me here to talk today and to answer that calling. Well, and, and when you look at how many close friends you lost in a short period of time, that's what led you, plus the, 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 the salt, that's what all led you to say, I gotta control something. And, and that, you're learning that God was the one that would ultimately control, but what a journey, right? What a journey. Now, Truth Channel, don't leave that yet. Help, kid, help students understand Truth Channel for you and what that means. Because I think a lot of us, it's all up in here in terms of the messages that we, we listen to, that, uh, that we let in, that ones that we, we have from way back. So talk a little bit more about the Truth Channel and what that means as it plays out to help you in your recovery. The Truth Channel is really just things that you know to be true. Knowing that God loves me, knowing that no matter what goes on, my family is still going to support me. And just fighting the lies that you're not worthy of things, that your identity is in sports and your accomplishments, not in who you really are. And for me, the Truth Channel is just huge. Like, I journal about that all the time. And when I'm really struggling, and to this day, I still struggle with my eating disorder, but I'm able to fight because I know the truth, and it's just helped me tremendously. So. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you go ahead? If you're if you're ready to wrap it up, if you're not, keep going. Okay. Lord, teach me to love the unlovable parts of myself. I suppress the wounds of my past, shunning the injured parts of my heart, so that I will not feel the pain. I do this simply to endure. However, I know this does not lead to ultimate healing. I know this only prolongs my agony. So give me freedom and release me from this conscious and unconscious shunning. Raise to the surface those damaged areas of my heart that need your tender touch, those parts of my inner being that require your healing presence. I want to be made whole. I want to be restored. I want to be healed. Give me grace to love myself unconditionally to love these damaged parts of me. Bring people into my life who can help me in this process. Bring experiences into my day that will lead me to freedom. Restore me, Jesus, by the exercise of your power and recreate my life in you. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Okay. Yeah. Let's thank Morgan. invite you to ask, answer two questions right around you like we normally do, and then we're going to end with one more video, and then we'll get out a little, probably a little early, but here's the two questions. Thinking about Morgan's story, what, what did you learn about God through that story? That's question one. Question two, what did you, what, you like about her story? Just right around you, two or three people, just share that. What did you like about her story? What, uh, what did you learn about God through her story? Yay.
All right, go ahead and wrap up here a little bit. All right. We'll continue to uh, do what we've done before, and that is uh, we videotape these and we push them out uh, in the links as well. The way you get the link is uh, uh, go ahead and imsecond.lipscomb.edu, and that'll make sure that you're on the list that gets that out. Um, but, you know, Morgan, you mentioned a couple people, and I see a row of teammates um, and people in your life, and uh, it's a risk to lean in and say and, and, and ask somebody, hey, what I see or what I hear doesn't look, doesn't look good, doesn't sound good, can I help, let me lean in. It's a risk to be vulnerable, and it's a risk to lean in and, and invite that. In fact, if you're honest with people, it's gonna cost you more of your time, more of your money, <laughs> And you're going to be criticized. I can just tell you. Honesty in this culture, those three things often go with it. More of your time, more of your money, and oftentimes criticized and misunderstood, but leaning in to help and be, be truth. So I appreciate your vulnerability and transparency. It makes us, and that truth channel is so important. There's a, 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 a song that I've been playing routinely called Greater, and it talks about greater is he who's in us and what he says about us than what Satan does say about us as well. John 10, 10 says what? The thief, Satan, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Literally, he tried to take out Morgan, get her off the planet, get her to a place where she's done and out of this life early through a lot of junk in this broken world. Some that she invited, a lot that she didn't invite. But the thief comes for that reason. But I come to give you life and give it abundantly. Full throttle life. And that's what God offers. And you're tasting. And you're finding in your stories you share that.